So we're here at the Hinkley Point C Visitor Centre at Cannington Court and I'm joined by Sasha Dench who has just finished her second stop on the Round Britain Climate Challenge. Welcome Sasha. Thank you very much. Congratulations on making it this far. Thank you. How's it all going? It's been a really interesting journey so far. I think from the early stages where I knew there'd be some uh, challenges with the electric power motor is it's a, in effect a prototype machine that has never been tested in expedition environments and we were basically starting off from the Scottish west coast which has some areas of nice flat coastline but lots of areas that are more challenging and so I, we basically were uh, started off with testing it in some really challenging places so there were definitely some big hurdles there to get over uh, but the really nice thing is that the welcome and Welcomes we've been getting in different places and the people we're meeting are really inspiring. So that's what gives the energy to, to carry on and keep flying, keep putting that heavy, heavy pack on my back and get airborne again. Speaking of the pack on your back, <laughs> how's things going? So I understand there were some issues with the, uh, with the power motor early on. Is that, is yeah. that all working okay? Yes, yeah, so I've had to make some modifications to the motor, um, some modifications also to the way that I fly, and I've also learnt uh, the limitations and some of the alterations that we could make in the programming. For example, at full power with a battery pack, if I needed to get off the ground as quickly as possible and in a challenging site to take off from, there was so much going on that it was very hard to do anything other than use my thumb on the throttle at full power rather than so I couldn't really moderate and only give 90% for example um, and at full power I get was getting 15 seconds only before the batteries were getting hot and would shut off automatically for 10 seconds and then they would kick in again but that's not ideal in that circumstance I'd be much better off at full power we turned that down a bit so that I have at least a minute of that level of power um, which means I have a slower takeoff, uh, but it does mean I've got time in the air to sort things out, to make sure that I'm clear of everything, to settle into the harness, and then I can start monitoring the temperature and the throttle. So that was a pretty simple thing, but it took us a while to figure that out. Uh, also, with now the longer takeoffs, I have to um, yeah, slightly, slightly change the way that I fly so I don't get any oscillation in the wing on takeoff um, because I'm doing a longer run. Um, so yeah, lots of different things. Also the harness position, once you remove the fuel tank and put the battery in place, there was nothing actually holding the, uh, the, the, harness, the, the harness of the, um, the aircraft in place, basically what scoops me up. And because that wasn't there, I wasn't getting scooped directly up into the harness at first. So I was in effect having to take off, get to safe altitude all the time, hanging out of the harness by my arms and my, and my legs, um, which was all fine, but it didn't look fine really because I'd end up with quite a lot of bruises, which didn't look very nice. Um, but I've now figured that out as well. So there were lots of small things to try and pull together. And yeah, I now know the quirks of the individual batteries and uh, yeah, how, how long they're likely to last, what sort of warning signals you, you really get and I know what else to look out for. So it's been a learning curve but that's, we always said this was going to be difficult. If it wasn't difficult it wouldn't be interesting and it's a bit the message that we're trying to say about an approach to climate change. We have to be prepared to think quite differently, set big ambitions and be prepared to give it a go and some things won't work but if you set a goal that's big enough, what I've found in general in other expeditions is that people get excited about it and they want to help and it's those other people's ideas coming in that will help advance the expedition but also the paramotor and everything else. Fabulous, so is that how you've been adapting the paramotor then, is kind of with um, help and support from others who have come in and give you these innovations to try and yep. get that going. Yep, we've shared openly videos of things that have gone wrong and then we've got calls from people saying we think you should try X harness or that the idea that the petrol tank, moving the, moving the petrol tank was actually causing me a problem came from somebody watching a video and once he'd said it, it was really obvious and then he offered to do the, the, um, the engineering on the, on the frame which was brilliant, so we had suddenly an expert in that. We've had other people call up and say 35 minute battery time, um, we think we could make you something with hydrogen, could you do it all again next year? Um, wow. uh, which is kind of interesting that innovators are looking at it and seeing that it's at least a kind of a fun challenge that can help bring innovators together. So yeah, relying a lot on people stepping up and, and offering to help. 
I love the idea of that collective innovation yeah. to get there's this definitely, message There's made. definitely a moment which is a bit like being a stage diver on an expedition like this, where you're about to kind of launch yourself into something, but you, I definitely got to a point before the expedition started where so many people were offering to help getting in touch that I just was certain that once you jump off that stage, there will be lots of hands that will, wow. that will um, pitch in and help so you don't hit the ground. Incredible. Although I might have a couple of times, literally. <laughs> um, so what do you guys do when you're, when you're not flying, when you're not kind of adjusting the parameter and, and at your busy stops? What sort of things do you do in between? Set up camp, uh, edit stories together, speaking to the media, which is interesting, but the most important thing is stopping and talking to people. So when I randomly land in different fields, uh, because I have to fly as far as possible on every battery, we don't have the option of knowing exactly where I'm going to land on each flight. So I fly as far as I can and then find a relevant, suitable field that doesn't have animals, doesn't have crop in it, and land there. And I'm relying on going up to people and saying, you know, thank you very much. Are you okay if I take off again? Because in a paramotor, it is legal to land anywhere you need to, oh. um, but you do need permission to take off again. So I'm leaving kind of thank you cards, but that is also my opportunity to talk to people all around the country about climate change, their views, and particularly farmers, as farmers are being asked to look differently at, at feeding, at how we feed the country, and how they farm to feed the country. So that's been really interesting. There are also places which are dedicated, they're pre-organized um, stops with climate champions, people from all walks of life who are stepping up um, and having a go at tackling the climate crisis. Oh, it sounds like you're getting some of the great British hospitality as you go around there. Yeah, definitely. So who, who, are, who are some of the people that kind of stand out to you, some of the people you mentioned, kind of climate champions and people that are doing, um, you know, work on a local level? Who are, who are the sort of few that are standing out in your mind that you've met? So quite close to here, just north, we've met a family who inherited a farm and have decided to uh, put that over to rewilding and looking at the, well, put, it, put over a large portion of it to rewilding, learning that the name of their farm actually means eel moor, uh, got in touch with those looking at eel conservation because they don't have eels on the property at the moment, or very few, and they've started also a reintroduction program there, trying to bring eels back onto their property, but it involves mum, dad, it involves the kids, it involves the local community because they're using the site as a demonstration for other farmers in the nearby area to come together. So that, I think, is really exciting. Um, they're also not only rewilding their land, but they're also, as they say, rewilding their kids and having other kids come to, the, to their property and let them get into ditches, like play in mud, um, get back to nature and understand all the things that that brings to us, which I think is really important. Um, at the same time, I've spoken to a brilliant man who researched years ago the value of turning hedges, the narrow hedges we have, into shelter belts, which are five metres wide rather than the one or one and a half metres wide that we currently have, and the massive benefit that has, not only for biodiversity, but that it can also, certainly as our um, temperatures rise and wind speeds and things get stronger, there's more storms, that form of a sort of graded uh, shelter belt creates a bit of a greenhouse effect over the fields on either side of it and also creates shelter for livestock. So overall, despite the fact that you're giving over more space for nature, it increases crop yield and it allows the, gives animals a place to shelter so they lose less energy in keeping warm. So it has an economic benefit and he believes it is uh, it would work on almost any farm around the country and the really amazing thing is he's now in his 80s and he really wants to see a ma massive shift before he dies and there's nothing that's going to stop him uh, which is really exciting this is what he wants to achieve before he dies um, so he was really inspiring a whole family that have decided to try kelp farming um, growing of kelp is am amazing because it creates habitat it absorbs carbon, it can absorb nitrogen, but they're growing the kelp along with uh, different kinds of shellfish. So they're creating a f sort of a, f uh, a bit of an ecosystem out of a farm. And that's the message that's been coming from lots of different farmers. The fact that if we want to grow things more sustainably, it's about not growing one thing. Growing all sorts of things together can be more productive, better for biodiversity and absorb more carbon. Uh, so yeah, overall, I um, have been seeing lots of inspiring people from industry, from communities, um, and also individuals. And the question that I suppose I'm really hoping to answer for myself is, do I really believe 
that we can turn things around in, in the 10 years that we need to, if you listen to all the different UN warnings. Um, do I really believe there are people in industry that are as passionate about doing this as community groups on the ground, you know, growing, uh, growing trees and things in their local area? Um, and so far, I'm feeling pretty positive. Um, so you joined us yesterday um, at Hinkley Point C. Um, how did that go? How was the visit? Uh, the visit is all really interesting. I've never, like most people, I've never been to a nuclear site before. It is a site in development, so it was much larger than I had expected, and the actual nuclear reactor bit much smaller than I'd expected. But I've really got a much better picture now of exactly how it all works. Um, and it's also interesting to look at, whilst the footprint looks enormous, when you think about the site producing in the future 7% of the energy for the country, the footprint is not that large. And yeah, just being able to speak to different experts about all different elements, about the ecology, about the, about the technology, about the, the safety systems, about also the uh, safety concerns that some of the public have, and also hearing from those doing training in the simulator about how globally the industry gets together and learns uh, from incidents that have happened to make sure there's double, triple, quadruple safety mechanisms behind things, which is very, a very similar culture to what we have in aviation of when there, is a, when there is a problem, the industry gets together and tries to solve it rather than keeping sturm and trying to pretend it didn't happen, which I think is you know, essential for, for safety. So overall, it's been an absolute eye-opener and really interesting. Fabulous. We've loved having you as well. It's been brilliant. Um, so what's next? What's the next stop? So the next site we're going to visit is a wetland recreation site or a managed realignment site known as Steert, which is not very far away from here. Uh, and it's, it's particularly special for me because it is the site of my first ever totally solo paramotor flight. I mean, you only fly with one person, but it was the first time I didn't want somebody else there observing just in case, although I did ask a farmer's wife who happened to be walking past um, if she would mind holding my windsock for me. Um, but it was my first ever site. I really needed some aerial images of the recreation site because from the air, the picture that locals could get of what the site was and what it was doing, how recreating this wetland could breathe life um, back into the area and work um, as a buffer from coastal storms, etc. Uh, the aerial images tell that story way better than words, way better than standing on the ground trying to look at, across at it. Um, so I'm really excited to see what it now looks like as it matures and is many years on from there. I'm sure it's going to look really spectacular. How long ago was it you went? The first flight over it, I think, was my first flight over it must have been seven years ago. Has seven. it been around seven years? Yeah, yeah, the first flight must have been seven years ago. And the last time I visited would have been five years ago. So it's going to have changed a lot, isn't it? It will have changed a lot, back. yes. Oh, much lovely. more mature plants and a um, lot more wildlife. I do keep half an eye on the um, observations that are put up online of new species turning up and, yeah seeing it with your own eyes is special. I didn't realise you had such a close connection to um, Steer and the South West down here as well. Mm. That's really lovely. So what does it mean to have EDF as a lead sponsor on the Round Britain Climate Challenge? Obviously, without sponsorship, an expedition like this couldn't happen. It's also been great to have access to experts within the energy industry who can talk us through some of the issues around decarbonising the energy industry. That's really valuable. Also, the conversations we've had with staff uh, internally have been really inspiring. I've been asked quite challenging questions, um, which have been great for sparking. So obviously within the staff, there are experts in things that I'm not an expert in. So it's also good to have my own um, ideas and thoughts challenged. I found that really, really good. It's also interesting that people that we are speaking to, when I'm trying to tell stories, or a core part of this expedition is telling stories of sometimes ordinary people, sometimes individuals who have an idea, who are trying to make it happen, the idea for them that big industry is also interested in supporting that, supporting those local, uh, sometimes council level initiatives has been quite inspiring um, to them as well. So it's, yeah, works on lots of levels. Fabulous.
Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us, Sasha, and uh, best of luck on the rest of the trip. Thank you very much, and to all the staff who are following along and sending messages of support. I've also had some on my private socials from EDF staff, so that's great. Fabulous, thanks.